on risk communications in Oakland, California. Thanks for joining our webinar today on due diligence estimates for environmental liabilities in 2015. Uh, this is a, a new webinar that I've just written in the last uh, week and a half or so. Uh, it combines content from other presentations, and I just want to give you a sense of the content that we'll be reviewing today. First of all, I'll be giving you a little bit of a bio because I find that uh, most of the people that come to our webinars uh, haven't had the, the chance to meet face to face with me, so I just wanted to share with you a little bit of my background and provide an elevator speech uh, of the, uh, the overall presentation. From there, I'll cover some of the trends that we see are useful to watch, and then uh, the focal points of our presentation here today will be the questions to ask in 2015 due diligence, and then how to calculate uh, liabilities based on uh, the questions to ask, and then in turn, what tools to use in uh, forecasting environmental liability. Without a little bit about me, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Environmental Risk Communications. We started in Oakland in uh, 1994, so we just had our 21st anniversary. Uh, I'm the author of a liability forecasting software package called Defender, which is used for looking at environmental liabilities as described in different portions of generally accepted accounting principles. They're called environmental remediation liabilities, asset retirement obligations, and pollution remediation obligations. Our work is also useful in due diligence, watch list preparation, decision analysis work, and in counterparty default tracking. Our work supports um, uh, corporate remediation teams and PRP groups on the public agency side. We've supported uh, and are supporting uh, port authorities, as well as the engineering, consulting, legal, and auditing partners, uh, which help all of those remediation teams. My educational background, uh, my full bio is in my LinkedIn profile. I've got an MBA from Northwestern University in Chicago and a bachelor's in business from Georgetown. So what I'm not is not a CPA, not an attorney, not an environmental engineer or consultant. Instead, I'm a software developer from California who's uh, looking at environmental liabilities from a business perspective. Before starting my business, I worked for FMC Corporation as a product manager and a, as a business planner. And before that, worked for uh, several different remediation contractors in Chicago. I hope that background uh, conveys that uh, I may have a different point of view, and with that I want to give you a sense of what that is for 2015 due diligence reminders. First and foremost, we're finding that asset retirement obligations are now the largest type of environmental liabilities out there. Uh, since 2005, when there was a, a real settlement of what asset retirement obligations looked like in accounting principles, they've grown on average about 31% a year versus 4% a year for remediation or third-party site liabilities. Applying fair value measurement is an important part of how and why those numbers have grown for AROs, and applying fair value measurement is really an essential part of doing due diligence well. So if there's anything I'd like you to take away from it, today's presentation, it's that AROs are a big part of environmental liabilities, and fair value is the right way to calculate them. Another part that we'll cover today is that uh, all estimates that you do in a due diligence process will eventually go to a different type of money, whether it's operating expenses, reserves, or watch list of future reserve increases, or maybe even capital expenditures. But every number you generate is going to be decision useful and go somewhere. But keep in mind the type of money that you're using is important. It's, it's important to never underestimate the value of an independent technical review, a different set of eyes to take a look at an environmental liability. And then in terms of the tools themselves, to remember that financial modeling, where you look at decision versus, decisions versus project uncertainties, uh, is a critical uh, activity and a best practice and lesson learned. Emerging environmental regulations are always going to be cost multipliers in the work that we do, but also environmental accounting standards are evolving as well. And it's important to, uh, to remember that past measurements have been found to be unreliable because GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, around environmental liabilities have dramatically changed in the last 10 years. To keep the due diligence work rem, uh, relevant, remember to focus on the day one use of the estimates that you do generate. So some of, the, some of the trends to watch out there, financial assurance continues to be a way of, of monetizing or converting an obligation or a promise to perform work to a guarantee, which is a financial instrument in place that uh, affirms that the work is going to get done and is pre-funded. Environmental legislation and regulation uh, continues to be a part of, of quantifying uh, environmental liabilities in due diligence accurately. But also, as I mentioned in the previous slide, general accepted accounting principles is an important set of standards to keep in mind 
when determining what to book, what to reserve, or to not reserve. Another trend that we've observed in looking at environmental liabilities is there continues to be continuous discovery of asset retirement obligations. They keep seem to they continue to see, continue to come out of the woodwork uh, and and elsewhere in an organization. Finally, as I noted in the previous slide, classification of the costs that come out of the process into the proper type of money continues to be an important trend that we see expressed both in 10Ks and individual transactions. The next point that I wanted to underscore is that there are five different types of environmental liabilities that we see at ERCI. First and foremost, moving left to right, we see asset retirement obligations continue to be the most significant part and the, the, the quickest growing part of environmental liabilities that are out there. Examples of uh, asset retirement obligations are as uh, everything from asbestos removal to lead-based paint removal to mine closure and oil well plug and abandonment and power plant decommissioning costs. They tend to be high dollar ticket items. Environmental obligations are the, uh, the costs of managing legacy disposal costs at third party waste sites like Superfund sites and uh, uh, tend to be memorialized through things like consent orders and administrative orders. And uh, with that, let's move on to the next type of environmental liability we see, which are commitments, contractual promises, typically between companies or between companies and other owners of sites. Uh, regarding the promises to buy back sites or to uh, share in the cost of remediating uh, or closing down sites. Moving off to the right, uh, contingencies are the uh, um, uh, probable and reasonable, reasonably estimable types of liabilities that have been out there uh, for quite some time. That's looking at environmental liabilities more or less as financial claims, not as projects to manage, but as, as, as costs to, simply, to more simply uh, negotiate and settle upon. Finally, off to the far right, the last type of environmental liabilities that we see are those that are guarantees, that is, uh, projects themselves that have been converted to a financial instrument uh, called a guarantee that need to be placed on a different part of a company's balance sheet. Generally, when you're looking at due diligence, it's important to use the fair value measurement method. We'll cover how to do that a little bit later in the presentation here today. But keep in mind, if you do see numbers generated with the other method, probable and reasonably estimable, that method has its roots in, in what's called FASB-5, a portion of general accepted accounting principles that's since been superseded. But that method dates back to 1975, and it's a screen that's been, at this point, discredited for use in fair value measurement and in due diligence calculations. So again, if you see a number that says we are a reserve that was calculated under probable and reasonably estimable, you may still find those numbers in a 10K report. However, if you see them in due diligence, don't use them for the, uh, the due diligence purpose. A little bit about the accounting framework that we work in. Um, what we're covering today is covered in the boxes in the far right. We're going to be covering recognition, measurement, and presentation of environmental liabilities for internal consumption. We won't be covering anything to do with disclosure of information uh, that comes out of the due diligence process. Typically, again, a due diligence process is going to describe numbers that are going to uh, be internally instructive or internally useful to preparing a bid for income producing assets. So environmental liabilities are typically a, a subtraction from the valuation of income producing assets. That is not part of the disclosure process generally. It's generally a highly confidential forecast. With that, let's go over to the far left and identify that uh, the principle that we're working under is that uh, financial reporting information that we use, in, even the, that that we use internally, it's got to be decision useful, which means it's got to be relevant, which means it has to have uh, both a predictive value and a confirmatory value uh, when we look at financial calculations. Also, in general, numbers have to be have, have a uh, faithful representation and be complete, neutral, and free from error. These are the terms a generation of accountants have been trained upon. So these are the terms that you may see used time and time again in how to look at environmental liabilities. Uh, I thought it'd be useful to just present this information from FASB, which is one of the accounting standard setters here in the US, because it is, uh, again, a useful framework for making sure we're speaking with a common, uh, common vocabulary. A point about uh, asset retirement obligations before we dive into uh, more detail on them. Asset retirement obligations grow until the work is performed and then they, they drop off as the work is performed. An asset retirement obligation 
is a, a different way of looking at environmental liabilities that's really just popped up in the last 15 years, and it applies to income producing assets. If we're talking about uh, an environmental liability for a closed or divested site, this doesn't apply. But asset retirement obligations have come up because of the, uh, the, the changes to general accepted accounting principles, and it was meant to avoid the hockey stick uh, accelerated recognition of environmental liabilities that happened uh, 20, 30, and 40 years ago uh, uh, and were also a major part of, of environmental liability costs getting stranded in bankruptcies over the last 50 years. So what it calls for basically is gradual recognition over the useful life of income producing assets of the future closure costs of, of decontaminating, demo, demolishing, uh, decommissioning an income producing asset. And the idea here is that over the income producing life where there are revenues and expenses of a business, of a plant, of a mine, and so on, is that money will gradually be set aside for the eventual closure costs, which means that, that uh, as an asset is opened, uh, that accrual process starts at year zero as the, the, the asset is put into place. We'll cover how that's done on a, on a corporate-wide basis in, uh, and what those numbers are starting to look like in a few slides. But a couple of questions that uh, may be useful to, to run through in a due diligence process would be to check and see if a, pro a property isn't owned or leased or a property isn't in operation. If either of those conditions uh, require uh, or are in place, then an asset retirement obligation value isn't appropriate. Uh, the first bullet point, if a property isn't owned or leased, then a liability uh, is out of scope. Uh, an environmental remediation liability or an environmental obligation or a guarantee or a contingency is the appropriate measurement, not an ARO. If a property isn't in operation, same thing. It's just too late. ARO accretion requires that there be an active profit center in place, that there be an ongoing business. Otherwise, it means an environmental liability should be treated as a discontinued operation liability. Uh, other challenges that we see for looking at ARO numbers is a lack of data about key quantities, and this is quite common, uh, and it, the, the solution or the way through it is to just state any assumptions, whether it's from a comparable site or just from a, a rough rule of thumb from looking at, at the specific site, is just to state those assumptions and do a future variance analysis as more information comes in through inventorying what we Next bullet point that we uh, find are useful questions to ask if there's a lack of data about a facility closure date and the way through, which an auditor would use uh, in, in the absence of any other compelling information, is a, a, an organization or a company that owns a, an income producing asset will have a remaining life on its books that it tells the IRS. It'll have a depreciable, useful life calculation based on when an asset was first put into service. Each one of those calculations for each one of those assets will have a remaining life balance left, and that in turn will give an IRS basis number for identifying when a site will reach the end of its theoretical useful life, just for amortization purposes. It doesn't mean it's mandatory that it will be closed at that point, but instead it's a starting point for saying, well, if we have no other estimate, at least we'll use the IRS basis for uh, when the amortization schedule will run out and say, at least at that point, we'll know that we're, uh, we're at a, a reasonable starting point. And then as we have more information, we'll go from there. One of the challenges that uh, uh, environmental regulators and uh, auditors have found is where there is no regulatory enforcement, there's an implication that there might not be a cost. That's a fallacy, and that's one of the things that you may find in a due diligence process is you may find that, that an entity selling an asset may say, we don't have any ARO booked. We don't have any remediation or uh, demolition or decontamination or decommissioning cost booked at all because there simply isn't any regulatory enforcement. That's a fallacy. And that's, a, as they say in softball and baseball, a pitch in the dirt, you don't have to swing. The next point that we see as an obstacle is where there may be multiple methods of settlement with a corresponding need for identifying different ways of weighting those options so that an expected value calculation can be done right. Our short-term solution is if you don't have any information about weighting, simply weight the available options to you equally and reweight them as more options or clearer uh, option decisions uh, work themselves out in time. 
The final point is where we see multiple discount uh, rates in, uh, in use. It's important in the due diligence process to harmonize cash flows and harmonize the assumption about discount rates so that there is one consistent basis for calculating a present value of all types of environmental liabilities. The types of AROs that are out there, uh, just as a grocery list of reminders, asbestos and lead-based paint and mercury-containing ballasts and light fixtures are the more common ones. Also, creosote-infused utility poles and pilings that hold up structures out in the, uh, in the ocean or in fresh water. Uh, those are also uh, asset retirement obligations. PCB-containing transformers. Most every facility has a transformer. Most of those, if they, if they predate the, uh, the 70s, uh, uh, have or do contain PCBs, and those can and do leak and, and go into sewer systems, go into soil surrounding them, and become a persistent, persistent environmental issue. Other long-term closures or end of useful life issues tend to be things like power plant decommissioning, mine closures, landfill cap and cover, oil well plug and abandonment, pipeline decommissioning, and just general plant demo. Activities that aren't arrows are the box in the upper right corner, a divested plant that needs a cleanup, a spill that needs a cleanup, and so on. Items that are on the border between being an asset retirement obligation and not being an asset retirement obligation are RICRA closures and UST removals, and those tend to be whether or not a given waste stream or an asset is still in use related to a RICRA permit or an UST. I've got a quick test for you, a quick survey. I don't have any mechanism right now for uh, recording your answers, but I just want to give you a quick, uh, a quick uh, test of what is an asset retirement obligation. Here's a facility uh, up on the north slope of Alaska, a very remote location. It's called the Heald Point Drill Pad up in the Prudhoe Bay Complex, uh, and it's uh, uh, operated by a partnership of British Petroleum, BP, ConocoPhillips, and ExxonMobil. The land itself is a, a legacy uh, ownership uh, of a uh, Native American and the heirs of uh, Andrew Huenga. Uh, so what I wanted to characterize for you here is that this is a situation where you can look at a, a facility and, and sort of imagine the steps that would be involved in uh, decontaminating, decommissioning this income-producing asset, in case this series of oil wells that are at the Heald Point drill pad. So a quick question, what, uh, of what you see here is an asset retirement obligation? The short answer, everything man-made that you see here, from the berms that uh, uh, protect the, the drill pad itself from inundation from, uh, from a rogue wave on the ocean, and here we're, we're jutting out into the Beaufort Sea in the north slope of Alaska, any of the pipelines, any of the drill pad equipment, any of the roads that you see are asset retirement obligations. When I took a tour of the North Slope of Alaska, the driver of the, uh, of the, of the van told us that uh, the, the road that we were driving on when all oil production activity ceased, the gravel that we were driving on had to be put back in the gravel mine. Such was the agreement between the, uh, uh, the operators, the leaseholders, and the state of Alaska that the gravel on the road had to go back into the gravel mine at the end of the useful life. With that in mind, I just want to give you a sense of what sort of numbers we're looking at for companies today. Uh, here I'm comparing two of the large landfill operators in the U.S. These are the two largest by market capitalization, the two largest publicly traded companies, Waste Management and Republic Services. Uh, each of the companies has roughly a billion dollars of asset retirement obligations and you see the phase in or the recognition of those environmental liabilities have really just kicked off in the last 15 years as new accounting procedures, principles have come into play. And there have been just major upticks of 200 to 500 million dollars associated with accounting policy changes and acquisitions. Those are the two big drivers you can find for most any changes to this type of environmental liabilities. If there's an acquisition in the case of, uh, of Republic Services, and, and waste management back in 1999. There are big, there are big upticks of, of the combined recalculations of the asset retirement obligation balances. And then as accounting policies changed, they changed initially in 2001 and again in 2004. You see that there are upticks uh, throughout that uh, time span of 01 to 04 for these two companies. You also notice that each company is more or less in this, uh, this uptick or sort of a sawtooth pattern of gradually increasing asset retirement obligations. This is something auditors expect to see and want to see uh, because this is how the policies are supposed to work. As a, because asset retirement obligations are a present value calculation, 
one should expect to see a gradual unwinding of the discount rate as the present value and the, uh, the closure dates become closer and closer to the present. In other words, the unwinding of a present value into a present value, into a, a current value, is, is what we're watching here with these uh, numbers going slightly down and then, and then bumping up, and then the gradual long-term trend is for larger numbers. What we can expect to see is for these two companies, which each have market, uh, which, which have total asset values, rather, of around $20 billion in total assets, looking at roughly 5% of their total assets are these asset retirement obligations. In addition, there are also financial assurance guarantees on top of those numbers. And we can expect those numbers to continue to accumulate uh, for some time to come because it's a cost of doing business. As the asset base is growing, the asset retirement obligation balance is growing as well. Let's switch gears to another industry, metals and mining, and we can see the same sort of trends. As the asset bases grow for Newmont Mining, the largest gold company in the U.S., Freeport, largest copper company, Alcoa, the largest aluminum company. As their asset bases are growing, their asset retirement obligations are growing well. So what do I see as, as trends you can use for uh, due diligence calculations? Well, if you know the total asset value that you're looking at, you should probably be looking for asset retirement obligation numbers in the 2 to 10% range. In other words, if you're looking at a $100 million acquisition, Look for two to ten million dollars of asset retirement obligations before you even uh, dig very deep. You should be looking for those types of numbers to already be on the books and expect them to be growing. What I've got here is a, a, a chart that backs up that, that presumption, uh, and it's based on some 10K data that ERCI researched in looking at 20 company, 21 companies over the last 20 years. So 21 publicly traded companies, 20 years of data. And what we found is ARO numbers just did not exist uh, back in, in 1995 to 2000, and really in 2003 to 2014, in other words, the last 11 years, they've really started to grow. On average, across those 21 companies and a wide range of industries, they've grown from, on average, 2% to about 4%, but the upper end of the range is where I get my 9 or 10% top-end number. So again, if you're looking at conducting due diligence and conducting them on a um, uh, a set of assets that fit an industry pattern. Look at what that industry pattern looks like, and if it's in the two to ten percent range, don't be surprised. Again, a hundred million dollar acquisition, two to ten million means two to ten million dollars worth of AROs, just as a starting point. So the questions to ask uh, uh, really have to do with whether there are booked reserves for environmental cleanup liabilities like Superfund sites, and if there are booked asset retirement obligation numbers already to work with. Those are generally in 10K reports and pretty quick to find and plotting that data off over the last 20 years never been easier. Uh, it's uh, using public domain data that's published on the sec.gov website. If there are policies in place for recognizing and measuring environmental liabilities that state clearly a time horizon, inflation or discount assumptions, get your hands on that policy because that'll tell you what were the filters applied for generating the booked reserves that are described in number one. So again, getting your hands on a policy, which should be, again, a, a part of what an auditor would take a look at and that's been vetted and more or less uh, put in the public domain, that's, again, something to, uh, to get a look at because it can tell you how the spreadsheets were generated that, that generated the uh, turn the portfolio-wide down. Take a look, if you can, at the background of any estimates, estimators who are generating any environmental liability forecasts, and look for something that auditors look for, which are systemic biases that come from vendors or plan employees. Or take a look at the age of any estimates and see if there are cost engineering exercises that were performed as part of the process. Again, take a look at the level of cost engineering done and see if there is, a, again, a, a background of the estimator, peer review work that was done, and if the work has been updated in the last 12 to 18 months. Next bullet point, take a look at whether fair value measurement was ever applied. In other words, if the costs of, of counterparties failing, the remedy not working out as originally intended, and if, there, and if any other calculations or steps were performed like decision analysis or Monte Carlo modeling, it could probably be a useful uh, set of data to find in a data room that will help you understand if fair value measurement was done or if just 
probable and reasonably estimable estimates are the only thing available. Take a look in turn for spreadsheet corruption. Uh, Excel has a very useful uh, auditing function that helps with doing that. Uh, and also finally look for environmental cost recovery experience from, from mechanisms like cost reimbursable contracts, tariff recoveries for common carrier pipelines, and in indemnitor or guarantor uh, payments coming from third parties. These in part go from whether or not a company may be working with 100 cent dollars, 0 cent dollars, or anywhere in between. And it's important part to keep in mind because the uh, acquisition or divestiture really can reset whether or not those uh, previously in place cost recovery mechanisms will be viable going forward. As I move forward with this, I want to just highlight some of the differences that come up in how environmental liabilities can be calculated with the same cash flow forecast. And here I want to contrast, for example, the way EPA may be looking at costs and a corporation may be looking at costs. And here, for example, let's take uh, an example of where we've got a, 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 a super fund site with $30 million that's expected to be spent over 30 years. EPA uses different inflation, discount, and time horizon assumptions than are called for in general accepted accounting principles. And that in turn means that EPA numbers may be 10 to 50 percent different than what a company may look at in terms of general accepted accounting principles. Uh, and so here in my example here, I've got the numbers that will be in an EPA record of decision. They tell you here's a $30 million project. But the pre in present value terms, uh, that cost may be uh, pretty close to that value um, and, and give a 10% allocation, a value of about $3 million. But for financial assurance purposes, that very same cash flow stream will be discounted by a smaller factor. And in turn, a corporation will use a different time horizon. And so what, uh, what may show up as an EPA record of decision number of $30 million turning into a $3 million liability. For financial assurance purposes, a company may have to have a $3.3 million guarantee and may only book a $2.7 million value uh, on its reserves. So again, different accounting methodologies, different purposes, different stakeholders, and in turn provide for a different set of calculations. And in due diligence, you normalize for all these biases. So different inflation, different discount, different time horizon. In term, if a, uh, in, in turn, if a project is at an early stage or has never been characterized before, the degrees of uncertainty are quite wide around that estimate, that forecast. As more information comes in about what tasks will be needed to execute a given project, and as there is alignment between what a project is and what the liability is, and they're not necessarily one and the same, but as there's better alignment between what a project is to extinguish liability and what the liability is itself, uh, then that uncertainty gap sort of gradually diminishes and goes away. In, in terms of looking at fair value and expected value, what we find is an important process is to take a step back from the third party or vendor quote costs and start to factor in the, 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 uh, the key issues that come in and getting to a fair value. In our experience, our extemporaneous uh, rules of thumb are. You got to look at remedy failure, project management, and counterparty default to get from the third party costs to get to a fair value. The reason I bring this up is what you're working on in due diligence is the number on the far right, the fair value measurement. You're going to be creating a brand new fair value for a site specific environmental liability or for a portfolio of environmental liabilities. What you may only be given to start with is the number on the far left, the vendor quote, an estimate of what the third party costs are going to look like without any allowances for things like remedy failure, project management, and counterparty risks. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the mechanics of these calculations. Uh, but what I want to do is uh, to remind you about, about following this in more detail. If you have any questions at the end of the presentation, feel free to ask them. And if you want to review this information in the handouts, uh, the PDF is in the GoToWebinar control panel, feel free to download. Another thing that we've uh, uh, become proficient at at ERCI over the last 20 years is looking at Monte Carlo modeling. And one aspect of, of managing the Monte Carlo models uh, is looking at uh, some of the correlation coefficients that go into looking at individual cost factors. This is the part where Monte Carlo modeling can break down really fast is that this correlation work isn't done right. 
The reason why is when you're using Monte Carlo modeling, by default, all of the Monte Carlo modeling tools out there do one thing. They let extremes of, of uncertainties cancel each other out. So if you have a Monte Carlo model with two assumptions, you can uh, expect that the low to high range, the P10 to P90, or the uh, two standard deviation measurement is going to be quite wide. You can expect a lot of volatility. But if you factor in 10, 20, 30, 40 different variables in a Monte Carlo model, what you can expect to happen is those uncertainties will cancel each other out and provide a false degree of certainty around the liability forecast. This can be a career ender. It's an important point about doing due diligence estimates right is to remember that environmental liabilities have high, sky high, positive correlations. In other words, when the liability costs on one site move up, it's probably moving up on many other sites at the same time in precisely the same way. If you don't attach those correlations to, from one site to another properly, the low to high range for an individual site will be canceled out by the low to high range for another site, and the tails of those extremes for the whole portfolio will look wrong, and they won't be accurately articulated, and therefore the bargaining position that negotiators will take in a buying and selling situation will be all wrong. There will be a false sense of security or certainty around what the range of environmental liability will look like. All that starts with individual liability forecasting for individual component items. Here where you look at an individual line item and say, what is the 10, 50, 90th percentile of that individual cost component? And when you step forward, there's not only the a matter of looking at individual cost items, but also the timing. In due diligence, you're working in a present value environment. You're taking a fair value, an expected value, and a present value. Let me go over those three again. Fair value means you're weighting in the range of extreme outcomes. Present value means you're using today's dollars. Expected value means you're weighting in different decisions and scenarios that you have available to you. You're supposed to generate for due, for due diligence all three of those at the same time, which means a turn modeling time. And that's one of the things that we found is, is, is very tricky to do at ERCI. And that's take, for example, Microsoft Project Worksheet, which is built on the uh, Microsoft Excel type of template, but is its own application. Microsoft Project is its own uh, Microsoft Office tool. It's possible to apply Monte Carlo techniques to the timing, the delayed implementation, the delay in duration of a given phase of activity, and have that show in to the fair value the due diligence cost that you project for an individual liability. It, there's, there are ways to get it, a lot of ways to get it wrong and just a few ways to get it right because at the end of the day, the consumers of data are looking for this. They're looking for one, two, three, four scenarios to resolve an environmental liability and they're looking for reasonable bracketing on the low, mid, high range. If the work isn't done right, everything starts to look like a toothpick running up and down across a point estimate and that's the career-ending outcome you don't want to be a part of, is you don't want to convey the too little risk for environmental liabilities. All our experience in managing environmental liabilities, my personal experience over the last 25 years, is that the, the toothpick is tilted way over on its side like a 45-degree angle. Environmental liabilities span lots of cost outcomes. And falsely articulating that there's a lot of certainty is one of the key points that I want to encourage you to think about. As you look at environmental liabilities, you want to convey the sources and methods of, of disposing of risks that are inherent to environmental liabilities. And what we found are things like tornado diagrams and Monte Carlo models are absolutely pivotal to doing the work well and doing it right. Another portion of, of getting the fair value correct, as I noted in the, uh, uh, the waterfall diagram we had three or four slides back, Let's look at the, uh, the, the effect of counterparty risk. And counterparties are a significant issue in looking at the, the, a due diligence forecast because counterparties can and do affect the net value of a liability that gets transferred. Why? Because you have cost sharing agreements already in place. You have indemnities and durations of guarantees coming from a buyer that might or might not be coming to a seller. So it's important to look at cash flows from an existing liability and, and get a good understanding of whether the original liability holder is working with $0.10, cent dollars, $0.50, cent dollars, $0.90, cent dollars, and whether that will pass through exactly to you as well. 
Uh, in the case of, for example, government contracts, if you're building, for example, helicopters for the U.S. Army and you've got a pass-through of environmental costs back on a given contract, then your net cost may be quite low. If you're working an insurance policy, uh, the cost may or may not pass through because you're not one of the original insured uh, parties. And if you're working with a common carrier pipeline or power company, uh, and you have passed through of all of your costs to your rate payers or to your tariff payers, you may be quite indifferent to what the environmental liabilities are at, a, at the moment in the due diligence process because those costs, whatever they turn out to be, high, medium, or low, will get uh, built into the, the rate structure of a larger enterprise and larger transactions. <clears throat> Second point I want to confirm for you is that counterparties are often already noted or stated in the public record. Often you can find who is a, a business's major customers or uh, what part of uh, transactions have allowed for indemnities or guarantees to be put in place as part of previous transactions. You often find those through 10K reports and in data rooms as part of a contractual uh, previously existing purchase and sales agreement. So again, it's important to do it when doing document search, not only to Google and look at the sec.gov website for public domain information, but also to look at the data room and see if, if co-owners or legacy owners of assets and the associated AROs are identified as well. Another point to look for is the insurers of counterparties. And uh, uh, again, why do you want to understand your counterparties, you might not be able to depend on their promise to pay, their commitment. You might not want to, to, to build in terms of conditions that allow for them to co-pay or to fund environmental liabilities in the future. You may want to work in the expectation that they may not be around over the next 10 to 30 years that it'll take to extinguish an environmental liability, and you may want to discount their promise to pay accordingly. So again, just to move forward here on the calculations that you want to look for and present in 2015, and again, this is this is what you want to look to, uh, to, to purpose your information for, you want to do a calculation of your revised ARO values and come up with a new accretion schedule. That is a day one activity that, that new assets will need. They'll need a new time-stamped valuation of an asset retirement obligation, and uh, that'll go again to what a company will want, an acquiring company will want to book as their new accretion schedule. Next, you want to uh, communicate revised balances for non-ARO liabilities, like environmental obligations, the classic third-party circle liabilities, commitments, that is a promise to pay, uh, to pay others, contingencies, which are the type of, uh, of claims-adjusted environmental liabilities, and guarantees, that is the, the financial assurance guarantees that will or may need to be issued to handle future environmental obligations or contingencies. You also want to look at presenting a watch list of prospective future reserve increases. I've got an example coming up. Uh, but what you want to cover in that watch list are things like scope changes on the AROs and other obligations, the probability and financial impact of counterparties deteriorating or going broke, the cost of financial assurance mechanisms like letters of credit, uh, performance bonds, uh, surety bonds, and uh, uh, insurance policies to promise regulatory agencies that, that closure work, demolition, decontamination work will be performed. You also want to factor in the cost of failed guarantees and commitments because not every company's got that equivalent or, or consistent ability to pay with your company. To demonstrate that last point, I just want to show you uh, from June 2014, what was the bell-shaped curve of, of the credit ratings of different Fortune 500 companies? And I just want to reinforce the idea that even though a company has got a, a well-known brand and has got a, a large revenue base and a large asset base, that doesn't mean that their credit scores are exactly the same and that they're all above average. Here I just want to underscore the idea that Microsoft and Apple, IBM and Chevron have very strong uh, credit ratings. And as you get to the middle of the pack, you get to Walmart, Valero, Google and FedEx. And as you get into the lower half, you get companies like General Electric and Ford, and as you get to the very, the very low end of the commercial credit score last year, you have the major airlines, uh, Delta, United, and American Airlines, all of which have been through bankruptcy in the last 15 years. Uh, United has been through bankruptcy twice, actually. Uh, so again, the ability to pay the commercial credit score is not evenly distributed. It is not all perfect. It's instead this bell-shaped curve, and, and organizations move around this bell-shaped bell curve 
quite often. You may look back at, at this year and see that the airlines have generally started to creep up toward the middle of the pack, and, and other companies like the oil and gas companies have slid down a little as the, uh, as the price of oil has dropped in half. Where do those calculations go? They go into an actuarial table like this that the RCI loves to build, where you've got a, a, a forecast of what the counterparty risk portfolio looks like. And on the next slide, you've got a watch list that identifies how those values will play out as future reserve increases. Both of these types of calculations, actuarial in nature, inform the expected value, the fair value of an environmental liability. So the outputs that you're generating, the outputs that you're working on, when you value a site-specific liability, you're going to be generating something like this, a site-specific recognition trigger, a site-specific probability of a reserve increase, and a site-specific low, mid, high, and timing uh, uh, variable identified for all the specific items you come with. And, and generally, just Excel is the tool of choice, but the thinking that goes behind it is the tough part, and the documentation, the, the audit trail that you generate and leave uh, often becomes a reserve basis that's used going forward uh, for a lot of useful purposes. So again, I encourage thinking about this watch list and the actuarial calculations from the previous slide because they have worked, and what they do is they demonstrate reasonably possible reserve changes. They, they demonstrate that recognition benchmarks are known and understandable and auditable. And it's actually described in general accepted accounting principles. I've got the specific citation there. It's actually a disclosure that's encouraged uh, but not required today. In general, just to sum up, the, the uh, due diligence process should look something like this, taking a, a variety of factors that aren't part of classic budgeting, classic reserve forecasting, but instead incorporate a wide range of different outcomes. And what I recommend to do this process in is the domain of fair value measurement. Fair value measurement means you're looking at the market price of cost today and assigning a level one, level two, level three degree of accuracy to each one of those assumption sets. We'll go over how to do that in a second here. Look at, let's look at line, line item A for a second, which will be a life cycle cost projection. Let's say we've got a site where we expect to do 12 years of pump and treat on this groundwater pump and treat cleanup site. We expect to have 10 gallons per minute of groundwater coming out of five wells, and we expect to pump out that aquifer three times over. In other words, three pour volumes over the 19-acre site. Well, those are very specific, measurable, quantifiable items. These things need to come out of your due diligence process, and I can only wish you good luck in finding them in environmental reports. I've really struggled with, with digging out data like this out of an environmental uh, condition study um, because these types of, of inputs are often embedded with a lot of assumptions. There's not a lot of certainty around them, and there's not a lot of givens in terms of whether this will actually work. Uh, but these are the types of assumptions that you start with because you're trying to generate something that's decision useful. But we found in turn, looking at the duration, the size of, of, of systems, uh, and the, the, the type of, of target waste volume that's being looked at, we find that those are fair value measurement level two. We know something, but not everything. That, that's actually a very sound place to start as we get the level one outcomes of, of market prices that are readily tradable and exchangeable and insurable with, with vendors, great. But we find it's, 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 um, uh, it's a little too easy to just say every environmental liability is a level three. We have no idea what that cost can be. So we're just going to use what are called SWAGs, or silly wild ass guesses. Auditors are trained now to look out for SWAGs. They're looking for actually something they don't call SWAGs, they call it unstructured judgment. And auditors are on the hunt for those. You may have heard about some other successes that they've had in looking for unstructured judgments in pension liabilities, post-retiree medical liabilities. They're gunning for environmental liabilities next, I believe. In certain industries, not in every industry is, it, is our environmental liability material, but in uncovering the, the, the fair value assumptions around pensions, uh, auditors have really had a field day in correcting those numbers and in making sure companies are held to account for their benefit uh, descriptions and benefit, uh, benefit offers and also their benefit forecasts matching up with the promises made. So fair value measurement is a part of pensions. It's a part of looking at post-retiree medical costs. And it's a part of looking at environmental costs. 
I encourage getting to the level of care that an auditor will expect by applying a term sheet like this. The next item that you look at on this list, item B, will be contingencies that you'd see in that the watch list in the previous slide. Contingencies for changes to scope and schedule and vendor. And here, for example, my assumption is we're going to have a 25% cost increase. We're looking at a fourth pour volume, pumping that out, and doubling the well count from five wells to 10, to 10 wells in years 8 to 12. Also a level two assumption, also an associated cost with that. I repeat that process for several other line, for all these other lines here, given what assumptions I've got and what I'm saying to you is for an individual site, this is what good due diligence looks like. You're trying to get the inflows and outflows on an expected value, present value, and fair value basis. If there's anything you take away from today, I hope it's this slide. This is what due diligence does need to look like because it helps with the auditing and helps with the, uh, uh, the day one forecast because it provides that comprehensive evaluation that prevents a deal team and also the, uh, the acquiring entity's accounting team from getting blindsided or surprised at day one. So in preparing for day one, a couple points to keep in mind. Up until day one, it can all still fall apart. Keep in mind that, that businesses stay independent until there is FTC approval, merger approval from the Justice Department, and uh, shareholder votes. All of those have to take place from a business perspective first, you get regulatory and shareholder approvals, and until all of those ducks are aligned, it's still too early to say this, these numbers are what we can expect in the budget and in the, uh, the program management and vendor uh, utilization for next year and the year after. Second point to keep in mind, there are people behind every one of these numbers. There are people worried about their careers, about their factory, about their coworkers, there are people behind all of these numbers. People don't want to see wild oscillations. They don't want to see uh, forecasts discredited as being unauditable or unreliable. So keep in mind when you talk about a due diligence forecast, you're talking about taking a different accounting approach to, to uh, numbers that may already be reserved uh, but need to be marked to market. That's what fair value measurement is also colloquially referred to is you're going through a mark-to-market process and saying if we're going to acquire the assets for, for market value, we're also going to adjust the liabilities, including environmental liabilities, for fair value. So keep in mind that running down the original preparers and, and identifying numbers as being unreliable is, is problematic because they're, they're prepared under different conditions, different assumption sets, and under different conditions you may be preparing exactly the same numbers that were prepared by other people. The third point I want you to remember, the day one liability valuations are important. You need to have them ready to go. But in day two, you've got to be ready to use your 24 months of purchase accounting, uh, uh, double checking, to reconfirm the assumptions that you made in due diligence with your data rooms at an arm's length. Reconfirm all those assumptions. You have 24 months from day zero, day one. 24 months to adjust your values so that, that the, the correct value, the fair value, is adjusted into the asset valuation, into the balance sheet, into the purchase price. If you have any questions about this, you're talking to a guy with two business degrees, call me. I'll, I won't explain this in legal terms or in regulatory compliance terms or environmental engineering terms. I'll explain this in business terms, and I'll be happy to share this with you. But it's, again, I, I think of it as your second best chance to reconfirm that you've got the right reliable numbers with your new information. Fifth point I want to underscore, lead from the front. Make sure you're using one set of tools and training after day one, day one uh, closes. Don't let legacy forecasts, legacy methodologies, or under training of your consultant and legal teams. Uh, don't let under training be the reason why you can't update numbers within your purchase accounting window or going forward. Final curveball, don't signal any asset shutdown decisions. Remember that, uh, again, there are people behind these, uh, these decisions and they need to be based on shared understandings going forward. So the tools that we see are useful are, are using an uh, estimate template. Uh, ERCI has authored a lot of them, but we see what's an important part of having an estimate template is a single work breakdown structure, a comprehensive one, based on 2015 US dollars if you're US based. Uh, and, and using that for all of the sites that are undergoing a due diligence process. Second, vital, vital, vital to maintain a common cost factors workbook, identifying what your, your unit prices are like, 
harvesting your data from SAP or Oracle Financials, PeopleSoft, JD Edwards, whatever, whatever, whatever your enterprise cost accounting system is, whatever the acquired targets information is from their cost accounting system, and then identify the cost factors that are relevant to your industry. What's the rule of thumb that vendors would quote for a dollar per foot cost to plug and abandon an onshore oil well or an oil pipeline? What's the dollar, dollars per ton cost to dispose of creosote pilings at a licensed landfill? Those are costs that are known, they're explicitly available. You can find them out and make regional uh, cost adjustments from that. Uh, but identifying those cost factors, absolutely key and is a key front and loading step if you know you'll have due diligence work later on this year or into next year. Never underestimate the value of having good, solid, independent, technical reviews, both of the calculations themselves, which is the I does, but also of the of the uh, the environmental studies and the legal conditions themselves. So it's a technical review from the financial perspective, from the environmental uh, stewardship perspective, and also the legal perspective. Next point: when you use Monte Carlo modeling, be cognizant of costs and timing. Nothing happens as fast as you think, or at the cost you expect. So be ready to correlate properly your assumptions. Absolutely pivotal to getting a right portfolio value is that information starts at the sites. Use decision trees to separate your decisions from your uncertainties. And again, most importantly, remember you're creating a fair value uh, calculation of environmental liabilities. Apply fair value measurement principles. They're described in ASC 820 and GASB 72, depending on what type of organization you've got. Those are the US General Accepted Accounting Principles for corporations and public agencies, respectively. They're both in effect. GASB 72 just came in effect uh, last week, actually. Uh, came out earlier this year, and it's a brand new requirement for calculating liabilities for, uh, for public agencies, so keep that in mind. You want to factor in to get fair value measurement, cost and probability strategy failure, counterparty default, financial assurance, and watch out for double counting of risks, and watch out, uh, watch out for conflating remediation project cost forecasts with a liability value. The two are not the same thing. The cost to implement a cleanup project is not necessarily the exact same as a liability value. In fair value measurement, in due diligence, you're going to be setting a liability value. For example, you may be setting it at a at million dollars for a given site. The only thing that may be on the books today is a $500,000 project to excavate some soil. Don't conflate the two. That's a big risk, is to say the, the, pro, the costs that are budgeted, that's the best reserve we have. So that, that flew 20 years ago. That was very risky 20 years ago, by the way. But now that we've become more sophisticated and accounting is more complex and more detailed and auditing is improving, don't make the rookie mistake of conflating project costs with a liability value. Other two tools to remember to apply. Watch out for all appropriate inquiry when you do your web researches. It's important to store your databases, store your findings, and keep a record of what information you relied on. It's important also to train everyone you work with to work in a fair value environment where you're not conflating project values uh, with liability values. With, you're not conflating tasks with the totality of an environmental liability, which means in turn you got to train consultants and attorneys and, and, and auditors to some extent to what market prices look like, especially in today's environment where there are low inflation rates and low discount rates here in the US. Uh, look for that rigorous level of detail where you're costing out according to the term sheet that I presented a few slides back. And you're pricing in things like counterparty risk and the, and the burn down rate of past reserves and factoring in future reserve increases. Another tool for due diligence is to rethink and, and at least develop a sound understanding of what your current reserve policies look like. I'll give you a guarantee from looking at 10K reports over the last six months in my experience. My guarantee is you'll find that AROs are valued at fair value and that most environmental remediation liabilities like Superfund sites, uh, multi-party cleanup sites, are valued at probably reasonably estimable. That disparity, one company can have two types of environmental liabilities and use two methods for, for costing them out, is you'll find in, in, in uh, in conducting due diligence activity that the owner of those liabilities may not know that they've got a difference, may not know that they're, they're measuring two different types of environmental liabilities 
two dramatically different ways. They may not know that. Uh, finally, I just want to underscore the idea of developing and updating a watch list quarterly. We see our larger clients using watch lists. It's an idea that came out of Price Waterhouse in 2002, 2003. Uh, we don't see it widely adopted, uh, but we do see that it provides a good communication tool internally for, for uh, telegraphing what future reserve increases are going to look like. With that, we're at the end of an hour, uh, the hour point of our uh, webinar today. I just want to thank you for, uh, for joining us. If you'd like more information about ERCI, feel free to take a look at our website at erci.com and join our LinkedIn group. Uh, we have a, a webinar announcements uh, listed on that page. We also have a separate YouTube page where we uh, store recordings of our uh, previously delivered webinars. It's uh, June 2015, so we've got roughly uh, uh, 15 webinars stored up there right now, and we expect to have over 20 by year end. Uh, we'll just be adding them throughout the year. And so, uh, again, if you'd like a copy of the link to that page, uh, uh, feel free to email me at john at erci.com or give me a call. You can also just Google us, uh, and you'll find our YouTube page uh, very searchable, very readily. We've got other webinars available uh, in June 2015 on asset retirement obligations, how to recognize and measure them for 2015. Circle of Financial Assurance, which uh, is the, uh, the result of some new guidance that came out from EPA in April of 2015. And we've got, uh, of course, this presentation on due diligence estimates. But with that, I'll conclude this webinar and stand by for questions. Just a moment, please.